So thank you all for coming. My name is Zach Tolman. Uh, I'm lead, lead engineer at Wired, and I'm super excited to talk to you about HTV2. Um, my title of my talk is HTV2 and you, because HTV2 will affect every single person in this room if you're doing anything with websites, even if you're just browsing them. So I think it's important that we learn about this very important technology that powers all of our web connections. Now I'm going to give you a warning. During this talk, I'm going to say the word latency a lot. This will probably bother you by the end of this talk, but I'm going to use this word over and over and over. Because latency is essentially our enemy. If we want performant websites, we have to fight the evil latency. So let's learn a bit about what this latency is. You see, when you need to connect to a website, you're going to go to your browser, you're going to put in a URL, and your browser is going to send a request off to the server. The server is going to respond in kind. Now, this little dance has to happen anytime you make a request for something uh, on the internet. Your, the client has to connect to the server, server has to respond back, um, and this is known as the round trip time. This is the latency cost we uh, incur to be able to make a connection between a client and a server. Now, when you want to try to optimize this, people all kind of try to figure out, you know, how can we make this, the websites faster? How can we com combat this? And some people will say one way to do this is to make those tubes bigger. If we just make them bigger, things will go faster, right? Because we can get more stuff down a bigger tube. So this is increasing bandwidth. If we increase bandwidth, perhaps we can make things go faster. Other people will argue, well, no, maybe what we do is since we have to pay these latency costs all the time, let's just focus on reducing those latency costs. You know, and people do things like put the server and the client closer, maybe there's other creative ways we can find to reduce this latency. Ultimately, there's this argument of whether what's better, increase bandwidth or reduce latency? Unfortunately, smart people are looking into this question. Most notably, uh, a researcher at Google, Mike Belshi, wrote a fantastic article in 2010 that addressed this. What he looked at is what would have the bigger impact on page load time, increasing the bandwidth or reducing latency? So he did this. Uh, and he prepared some beautiful charts that show us uh, what we need to know here. So he first looked at bandwidth. If he increased bandwidth, what impact would we see on page load time? And what he showed is that if you increase bandwidth from about one megabit per second to two megabits per second, you saw about a 50% reduction in page load time. So initially thinking, okay, more bandwidth means faster. Well, when you went from two to three, you got a reduction, but it wasn't nearly as dramatic. Three to four was even worse. Four to five was even worse. You have diminishing returns as you increase bandwidth. The idea was that if you have very little bandwidth, increasing bandwidth will help. But once you get to something about five megabits per second, it doesn't really help your web browsing experience to increase your bandwidth. You, you, they kind of tail off around five megabits per second. When he looked at round trip time or our latency costs, as he reduced latency, you saw a direct correlation with page load time such that as you reduce latency or reduce your round trip time, you necessarily will reduce your page load time. So the idea here, and what he concluded, was that decreasing round trip time, regardless of the current bandwidth, always helps make web browsing faster. This is going to be the focus of the talk today. We're going to really spend some time on looking at why latency is such a pain in the ass for web performance, and then we're going to talk about how h 2 fixes some of these problems. But to do this, we need to dive a little deeper, and we need to understand what these connections actually are. So again, when we are connecting from a browser to a server, we have to establish what's known as a TCP connection. And this is done with a three-way handshake that looks a little like this. First, the client or the browser sends a synchronization request off to the server. The server responds in, uh, with an acknowledgement request and a synchronization request of its own. And finally, the client responds with an acknowledgement request. Now, we don't need to get into all the details of what those mean. They're just basically trying to synchronize, um, synchronize themselves so that they can uh, establish a TCP connection in which they can do HTTP. But each of these things has costs related to it. So just hypothetically, let's say that it takes 50 milliseconds to go from the client to server and the server to client. We have 50 milliseconds for the initial transmission, 
50 milliseconds for the second transmission, and then another 50 milliseconds for the third. Um, if we're all good at mental math, that equals 150 milliseconds total. Do you see anything missing here so far? Data. We haven't issued. We haven't even issued a damn HTTP request, right? So the websites that we spend time working on, the HTML that we home, the CSS that we really try to make perform it, it doesn't matter at this point. It doesn't matter. This cost is something that we have to live with um, initially because we have to establish the TCP connection before we start playing the HTTP game. Once you have that connection, you can actually make an HTTP request and say, "Give me this web page." So it's a huge cost here. Now, what about in the world of HTTPS or TLS? So if you want to make those secure connections, well, you start off the same. Client sends a synchronization request. Server responds with an ACK SYN request. Then the client says, oh, not only do I want to connect to you, but I want to be secure. There's a lot that goes on here. I'm glossing over so much. But it sends this ACK request, and then it does uh, what's known as a client hello that's saying, I want to make a TLS connection with you. Server responds with its own server hello. Says, OK, we can do this. Here's some information that you're going to need. Then the client needs to respond with a bunch of other crypto stuff and eventually says, OK, I'm finished. I have everything I need to make a secure connection. Server does the same dance, crypto stuff, blah, 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 blah. And it sends a, a finished message. Only at that point can you start doing what? your HTTP communication, you can start sending data. So I know I just glossed over like a three hour talk right there, but let's just kind of go back and review. That is three full round trips. And we said that uh, communication from client to server and server to client would take 50 milliseconds. So uh, 50 milliseconds times two for each of those round trips would be 100 milliseconds. So now we have 100 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds. We're at 300 milliseconds to do a full uh, a uh, TCP handshake followed by a TLS handshake and establish a secure connection. Right? This is crazy. This costs a lot. And that is that is time that you just have to be okay with because you can't really optimize that from your application perspective. So I hope at this point this is clear. Connections are very costly. When we make connections, we are going to slow down our application. And what we've talked about so far is just a single TCP connection. There's a lot of connections that are made uh, when you load up a website, a lot more than one, now at least. Um, now some developers got smart, they could find out that you, know, you can actually make more connections to a domain than just one per, um, per browser. So a browser will allow you to open up six connections per domain, which is kind of nice. It allows you to have more of those connections at once, but it limits you to about six, primarily so that a web viewing experience doesn't lead to a DDoS attack. Um, if you open up tons of connections to your site, you're going to have trouble. So just to show you how bad this is, I uh, took a look at one website. I'm not going to name names. Maybe it's something I work on sometimes. I don't know. Um, and I wanted to see what it looked like in terms of assets, connections, those sorts of things. It loads 284 assets. The start render time, so the time it, it takes for it to go from a blank white screen to at least one pixel that's not white, was 200 milliseconds, or 2,000, sorry, 200 would be awesome. 2,000, not awesome, two seconds total. No fewer than 101 connections. This is bad, because what happens with connections? It uh, increases the amount of latency. 8.5 seconds of latency in this. That's crazy, right? If we could reduce that amount of latency, we would see instant improvement in how fast this website renders. So just to kind of knock the point home, Mike Dalshi and his research said, to speed up the internet large, we should look for more ways to bring down the round trip time. Let's bring down latency. We're going to see improvements in speed. So uh, this was a really good suggestion, and it basically inspired HTTP2. But before we talk about HTTP2, let's talk about HTTP1, because HTTP1 has a lot of flaws. And in fact, these latency problems are inherent critical flaws in the design of HTTP1.1. So let me talk about some of these flaws. First one is we have serialization. When you open up one of those TCP connections, you can only deal with a single asset at a time. So if we look at this. Uh, your client will make a request for the initial HTML. The server does whatever it needs to do. In the case of WordPress, this is when the WordPress application would run. 
Uh, it would start by hitting index.php, then goes through loading plugins, themes, all that good stuff, and ultimately sends back some HTML. Once that's done, the connection is freed up. Now the connection can do something else. So then, most likely, the browser is gonna prioritize CSS because that's the most important thing that the browser needs to be able to start rendering. So then it'll make a request for style.css. It goes to the, uh, the web server, usually not gonna be hitting WordPress with this just because it's a static file. It returns style CSS, and then now the browser has that asset. Now it's freed up to do another little dance, so it might load up a JavaScript file, or maybe an image, something like that. You see the problem here? This, these are all serial requests. Wouldn't it be great <clears throat> if we we're able to do an HTML request and a CSS request while we're downloading images and JavaScript and all this stuff? We can't do that. This is, uh, there's a serialization problem here. We can only handle one asset at a time per connection. Similar to this, we can only, uh, every one request results in one response. We can't make one request and get multiple responses. So we have to do this again. We can't just say, send the request for the HTML and get back both the HTML and the CSS. We have to make the request for the HTML, we get the HTML back, then we make the request for style.css and get that back. The cool thing, though, is we live in a community where our developers are very, very, very clever people. They understand this latency problem, and we found fixes for this. So has anybody ever tried to like reduce HTTP requests in your web app? Have you ever like said, oh, there's too many HTTP requests, and you try to reduce it? Yeah. So this is generally called bundling. That's a technique that kind of covers a couple things. More specifically, you might do something like JavaScript or CSS concatenation. Because the problem is, is if we have five JavaScript files, and let's just say for argument's sake, we only have one TCP connection, we can only work on one of those JavaScript files at a time. Because we have to make the request for one, wait for it, then make the request for another, wait for it. Well, one way around this is if we bundle those five JavaScript files together into a single file, we make the request for that single file, and essentially we're getting all five of those files coming down at once. We don't have to wait for the one to finish before we make the request for the next one. This is uh, the similar case with image spriting. Has anyone ever done image spriting? Does anyone like image spriting? <laughs> It is the most painful, like, terrible thing in the world, so hard to maintain. We do it for performance, we care about performance, so by God, we will sprite our images. It's the same concept. Rather than have like these 20 little UI icons um, issuing individual HTTP requests to get that data, we package them all up into one file, and then we can make a single request and get that single request um, coming down the wire, and we don't have to wait for one request to finish to get the next one. So it's a really smart optimization, but boy, it sucks. Um, another thing we do, we try to bypass the six connection limit per domain. So again, when your browser tries to get assets from a site, it will only allow you to establish six TCP connections per domain. Uh, in the past, uh, it used to be only two, and then some browsers were doing four, but most browsers are, are settling on the six. Now, the idea is that if you have more open TCP connections to a server, you can do more at once. So, you know, going back to what we were looking at before, if you make that HTTP request, you have to wait for that HTTP request, or sorry, the HTML request to resolve before you can make the next request for your CSS. If you have six connections, that means you can actually work on six different things at a time. Um, in the case of the, web, the unknown website that I talked about before, there was 284 assets that we needed to download. So even though six requests will help, um, it's still not gonna be everything that we need. So what people have done to bypass this is they do something like domain sharding. Anybody familiar with domain sharding have done that before? Does anybody like that? No, another one of these terrible things that we do to try to bypass the limitation. So we know that there is a six uh, TCP connection limit per domain. So what we do is we just put our assets on different domains so we can get by that six, um, six connection limit per domain. So if you've ever seen things like images.cdn.com, images2.cdn.com, wordpress.com does this. I think they uh, shard all their images. Uh, up against three domains. 
Um, this is really, really difficult to do because now you need to like maintain some relationship between uh, the special new domain and your image, and then if you change those, everything else has to change, and you have to rewrite all your image URLs. It just it, it becomes a huge headache, and it's really annoying. But we do this again for performance. We want our sites to go fast, so these are things that we're willing to do. Another thing we try to do is optimize the critical rendering path. The critical rendering path are all of the assets we need to display the above the fold content for our site. So we realize that below the fold stuff doesn't have as much priority when someone's initially visiting our site. We really want to paint the browser screen as fast as possible for the stuff they can actually see, the above the fold content. So we optimize to make sure all of the assets that are needed to show the above the fold content are delivered as fast as possible. And we do another whole set of silly tricks like inlining CSS, or inlining JavaScript, or inlining images. Has anyone ever like taken an image, encoded it as a data URI, and then loaded that in the HTML, right? People have done that. Has anybody inlined CSS, like just basically taken CSS and put it in the head? Does anyone like to do those things? <sighs> yeah, this is one of these annoying things we do, but if you do this, you're gonna render your sites really quickly. Um, Maintaining it you know, is really, really difficult. Another problem is that you have to go like way out of your way to work with the browser cache with any inline assets, because if you're packaging up these inline assets in the HTML itself, if you have essentially downloaded that data for one page, but because it's all wrapped into the HTML, the next page view doesn't know about that asset, so you have to download it again. So it doesn't work well with browser caching. But we do it for web performance, right? We're, we're a committed bunch. We do these things. makes our lives really difficult. But we want fast websites, so we do them. Now, we've codified these things in the web development repertoire as best practices. <laughs> How many tools have told you to do these things? Seriously, have you ever like ran your site through something like uh, Google PageSpeed Score or like YSlow? They'll beat you up about these things. They are, they are promoted as best practices for our industry. However, I would like to suggest that they're actually just clever hacks. They're clever hacks around problems with HTTP 1. Primarily that um, we have the serialization issue that we have to get around. And then we also, uh, we can't get multiple responses from individual requests. In fact, these are such clever hacks that we've developed a whole sub-industry around these, these hacks. Not only have we done that, but we've like developed tools, and then other developers like, like to have these great opinions about how your tool sucks, and this tool's better because it actually makes it faster for me to do these hacks that make my site faster, but really that wasn't fast enough, and you know, I can make it faster with other things. So you know, we have Grunt, really popular. Uh, Gulp, I think, is kind of beginning to replace a lot of the, the Grunt tasks. If you're into Ember, you might know of Broccoli, which is supposed to be like a super fast thing. So we have this whole industry, and people really work hard on these tools, and you know, bless their hearts, it makes our lives easier to do these hacks. But you could just see how far we've gone with implementing these best practice slash clever hacks. Now, fortunately, HTTP2 was an opportunity to re revisit some of these issues with HTTP1. Why don't we just fix the damn issue and get rid of these hacks, right? Does that sound cool? Does this seem logical? I think it is. So HTTP2 really wants to try to reduce latency. And given that some of this research was initially done by Google, of course they would take steps to help us with this. So they initially developed a protocol called Speedy. People heard of Speedy? Uh, you've probably used Speedy a ton and don't know. Has anybody visited WordPress.com? <laughs> yeah, you're using Speedy when you visit WordPress.com. In fact, WordPress.com uh, funded some of the work to get Speedy into Nginx, which is really cool. So Google was able to develop Speedy. They started work on it in 2009, and they were able to start putting this protocol on their servers, and because they happened to control a very popular browser, Google Chrome, if you haven't heard of it, um, they're able to deploy this technology into their, their browser, and then they're able to start just testing this. Are people familiar with the concept of feature plugins in WordPress nowadays? So if you, you know, want to see a really cool new feature in WordPress, the, the recommendation is build a plugin, propose it as a feature plugin, and if uh, you know, enough of the community likes it, if the core devs want to see this in, their, uh, in WordPress, they'll, they'll merge it in eventually. That's kind of what like, Speedy was. 
Google developers said, we don't really want to like write this protocol out first. We have some great ideas of how we can reduce latency. Let's just do it. Like we control the client and the server. Let's just get it out there and see what happens. So Speedy was able to really inspire a lot of ideas behind HTTP2. Um, so now there is a full protocol for uh, HTTP2. There is an RFC behind this. And uh, one misconception is that Speedy is HTTP2. That's not correct. Uh, HTTP2 was heavily inspired by Speedy. A lot of the work that Google was able to do to show that these latency reduction techniques work were basically brought into HTTP2. So let's get to the, the, what we're here for. Let's talk about HTTP2 and what it does. So one of the best thing HTTP2 does for us is it allows multiplexing. So you make one single connection to every domain via HTTP2, and then it allows you to have multiple requests and response going from client to server at the same time. What this essentially means for us is that you should no longer be bundling resources. You shouldn't do JavaScript concatenation. You shouldn't do image spriting because the client can request multiple files at the same time and be receiving those files uh, while they're making requests. Uh, we have a bi-directional uh, connection that is, is uh, made and we can be making multiple requests while we're, we're receiving multiple responses. In fact, uh, what we consider this best practice of bundling things will actually be an anti-pattern in the future. You're going to hear this. You're going to hear a lot of articles talking about you should no longer be bundling assets when you are doing HTTP2 connections. Uh, additionally, you should no longer be doing uh, sharding. If you do the domain sharding, what you're actually doing is you're working against what HTTP2 is doing for you. You only need to make a single TCP connection, so you only pay that latency cost once, and then everything can go down that, uh, that connection. Uh, additionally, you want to get everything you can on a single domain. So let's say you're loading uh, fonts from Google. If you can, there's some nice tools out there that allow you to put those fonts on your own server, your own domain. There's some huge performance improvements that you can get from that, simply because when you need to make the request for that font, you don't have to establish a new TCP connection because that's hosted on Google servers, not your own. Um, so you'll want to try to get as many assets as possible onto a single domain. I know this one can be a little bit hard for people to hear sometimes because they might say like, well, what about a CDN? Don't you want your assets on a CDN? Yes, you absolutely do, but you also want that original uh, HTML page that's being downloaded on that same URL. So you want to get everything out at your edge so everything is on a single domain and you only have to establish one connection for all of those assets. Another really cool thing we get with HTTP2 is server push. This is essentially the concept that one request can result in many responses. So before, I talked about how you would have to make a request for HTML, and once the browser gets that HTML, so you have to wait for the server to you know, process all that uh, stuff that becomes your HTML, sends it down to the browser, the browser starts parsing the HTML. The browser knows that to paint the screen as fast as possible, CSS is one of the most important elements, so it tries to queue that up as fast as possible. And this is what it would look like. You make the request for HTML, then that connection is freed up, you make a request for style.css and receive style.css. But what if we did this instead? Make a request for HTML, and then your server is very smart, your application is smart, and says, with this HTML, I know that you're going to need the CSS, so why don't I just send it to you right now? You don't have to wait for, uh, for the browser to discover the CSS file in the HTML. I'll just send it to you right now. This is what we can do in the world of HTTP2. Before, like the equivalent hack of this would be inlining your CSS. Now, one of the problems with inlining CSS is when you inline that CSS in the HTML, you can't cache that CSS without a whole other host of hacks which are really, really painful uh, to deploy. In this case, you can use browser caching. Before that style.css is sent, it actually sends a message to the client saying, hey, I want to send you this file, do you need it? And it gives the client an opportunity to say, no, I have this in my cache, I don't want you to send that to me. So browser caching, using the same mechanisms that we've always used, will work with this. So server push is pretty awesome. No more inlining. That's huge, right? Like, everyone's super excited about this. Like, no more inlining, it's so painful. 
Uh, another cool thing that doesn't really relate to uh, what I said, but what I've talked about with HTTP 1 is we, we do get this concept of prioritization in HTTP 2. The browser knows that there's certain assets that are more important than other ones uh, when it comes to rendering a page more quickly. Uh, CSS and JavaScript are going to be the most important assets to get down to be able to render your page. Images, not so important, those can come later. Um, HTTP 2 allows us to have the server and client um, engage in this communication where the most important assets are received first. So we can set these priorities for the different streams that allow us to determine what assets will get down to the client as fast as possible. We have a way of basically saying that CSS is like, you know, has an importance of like 66%, whereas images are 33%, so then we give um, uh, CSS like 66% of the connection to be able to download these assets. Another really cool thing with HTTP2 is that HTTPS is required, kind of, kind of required. Uh, if you look at the RFC, there is no mention of TLS being required. This was a huge point of contention when developing the protocol. Many people were advocating for HTTPS or, or TLS um, just below the HTTP2 layer. Um, but there's also a lot of people who are pushing against that and said, no, this shouldn't be required. However, uh, if we look at a quote from Mark Nottingham, who is the chair of the W3C group that implemented this protocol, he says that HTTP2 is only supported by uh, all of the major browsers, uh, sorry, HTTP2 is supported by all of the major browsers, and if you want them to use it with your website, you'll need to have HTTPS URLs. So all the major browser vendors have come out and said, we will only do HTTP2 over a TLS connection, so it has to be secured, meaning that if you want to take advantage of HTTP2, uh, HTTP you first have to figure out how to get your site secured with HTTPS. Yeah. Are, you, are you gonna talk a little bit about why? Um, so the question was, are you gonna talk a little bit about why? Uh, I will mention some jargony stuff that may explain it. It's, it's a pretty hefty stuff, the subject. Basically, for the way that HTTP2 works is it relies on a binary protocol. HTTP 1.1 was just clear text, uh, ASCII text, that had um, just new line characters to eliminate, to eliminate new lines. Um, in order to be able to do the multiplexing, they found that the binary protocol was just a much superior protocol because you can just basically chop up all of these, these meaningful chunks into tiny little bits and send those. Um, and TLS is already a binary protocol. So if we already have that protocol, it's already like working for us, let's just use that. Um, and then also there was another, there's just kind of a political movement here. Like, you know, we have an opportunity to help secure the web, make communications more private when we move over to HTTP2, and all web developers are gonna to wanna to get on HTTP2, right? Right, all web developers, you're gonna to wanna to get on HTTP2. So if you need to do it, you have to secure your sites first. Right. So it's an easy way to push people that way. So we want to see some of this example, some some examples of this in real life. Yeah. So let's look at this demonstration called Gopher Tiles. Uh, this comes from uh, an example page by some members of the Go language team. Uh, they are working on an HTTP server to be used with uh, Go that will eventually become the HTTP2 uh, standard library for the Go language. And in doing this, they put up a demo page where you can like compare certain certain pages um, uh, over HTTP 1.1 versus HTTP 2. So let's take a look at this. We're going to take a look at HTTP 1.1. All we're going to see here is a page that loads an image of a gopher. But this gopher, gopher is the Go language mascot, if you're not aware. Uh, the gopher is chopped up into 180 different images. So there's a lot of, lot of resources to be downloaded. And each of these images has a delay when it hits the server. So you make the request to the server, and it delays for one second, and then it passes the image response back. Let's look at how this loads in HTTP 1.1. So you see the image start to load. You know, it's loading in slowly. You may not be able to count, but there's six of those tiles loading in at a time. Hopefully that number rings a bell. You're able to make six connections to this domain over HTTP 1.1. So then there's six requests for images and they get six back. 
And then once all six of those connections free up, you can make six more requests. And once those free up, six more. So then you have this sort of like stuttery load-in experience. Um, and that was just, I don't know what happened right there. Um, so, uh, lamp replacement is going to be needed soon. Just letting everyone know. Um, this page took 32 seconds to load in. 180 assets, 32 seconds. Let's take a look at what this page looks like. No changes to the application whatsoever, just changes to the HTTP version. Awesome, right? Feel free to cheer. Feel free. That's such a big day. So the difference here was that they made one single connection, and then all those requests could be made at the same time, and then there will be the one second delay on the server, and then they all just start streaming down. Um, I'm going to show you a different way of conceptualizing this. I ran both of these pages through webpagetest.org, which is one of the most phenomenal um, performance testing tools you'll ever find. Um, if you haven't heard of it, I wish I could do a talk on that alone, but uh, go run your, what, your favorite website or one of your sites uh, through web page tests and just start exploring. It's a fantastic resource. But one of the things it does is it reveals a waterfall showing how all the different assets load into your site. I know you're not going to be able to read this, I just want you to pay attention to the green. Um, what happens here is that it's showing all of the different assets that are loaded on this page. They're all images. What we have is this little, this sort of stuttery little uh, step of uh, assets loading in. We see six assets load, then we wait for that, and we see six more, and six more, and six more. What I'm showing you is a chunk of time that was 12 seconds, and we have all these different groups of six loading in. Ready for your mind to be blown? This is what it looks like in HDB2. Now, there you go. Feel free to cheer. Always a good thing. Always a good thing. Um, now just know that this looks bigger. It's not, it's only 1.7 seconds versus 12 seconds. It's just how these graphs showed up. But what you see here is that you make the initial connection up top, and then as soon as that connection is made, we can make all these requests that we're aware of, and they can start downloading. The one thing you might notice is that there's a little stutter right here, and that is most Sorry, I probably put my face in the way of that. There's a stutter right down at the bottom. And most likely what that is, is that the browser is uh, parsing the HTML, and it's not aware of asset number 34 down there. And then it finally makes those requests to queue up more, it's just because the browser hasn't made that request yet. And that's a stutter of like 200 milliseconds, not a big deal. So everything comes down at once, and it's so fast. So you're probably all asking, when can I uh, start pre-ordering this sucker? Well, I have great news. HTV2 is available today. Yes. Very happy. HTV2 is available today if you're using the right browsers. Um, so there's there's some support. Um, the good browsers, Firefox, Chrome, um, Chrome in iOS does support HTV2, which is awesome, and Opera. They all support HTV2. IE11 will be support, uh, will support HTTP2 in Windows 10, which is coming out in like a couple weeks. Um, Microsoft Edge will also have support for HTTP2, which is coming out soonish. Um, and then Safari, which is the big one, the big holdout, is uh, will have support for HTTP2 in 8.1, which you'll get if you're adventurous, you can have right now. Um, downloading uh, Apple betas is a very adventurous thing. Um, iOS 9 and El Capitan uh, OS X 10 by 10 will have HTTP 2 for Safari. Big, big deal. Um, what I would probably venture to guess is that once Apple's, once Safari has HTTP 2, um, all of a sudden you're going to see a rush of developers like, what is this HTTP 2 thing? Like, we need to probably start supporting it because they're going to realize that by just having that browser connect to a server that has HTTP 2 uh, capabilities, you're going to get a performance boost in your site. Um, what about the servers, though? Because the server also has to support HTTP2. That's a little bit of a bleaker situation. Um, Apache has support through a mod, so mod H2 uh, uh, will allow you to do HTTP2 with Apache. They're going to be baking this into Apache itself. Don't really know the timetable on that. Nginx has been pretty quiet about this, other than a few statements saying that by the end of the year, they'll have support. They had like one screenshot they showed on Twitter at one point like show they're working on it. So hopefully they get it pretty soon. Um, but what's also really cool is that this has given rise to some really neat new servers. 
Um, they're like, you know, really cool. Um, ng HTTP2 and H2O are new servers that handle HTTP2. Um, they're really fantastic uh, little servers. Um, I only have experience so far with ng uh, HTTP. Um, I actually have a link, and I'll, I'll share these slides so you can actually see the link later, uh, to my website. I kind of explain how I got this set up on my personal site. So if you look at my personal site and you have a good browser, you'll get an HTTP2 connection. Um, what's really cool about ng HTTP is it comes with a proxy. So essentially you can set up this proxy server in front of your current Nginx or Apache setup, and the requests are handled by the proxy, but they proxy off to Apache or Nginx, which can do all the WordPress stuff and passes it back. Um, you can pretty much do this without having to make major modifications to your Apache or Nginx. So if you're adventurous and you like to uh, kind of tinker with this stuff, I would highly recommend taking a look at ng HTTP2. I hear good things about H2O, but I don't know as much about it. Um, so, I think in conclusion, I just want to say HTTP2 is a huge game changer. I really highly encourage you to invest your time in learning more about HTTP2 rather than spending your time on figuring out a better build method for, uh, you know, bundling assets and, and uh, spriting images and sharding domains. That is wasted time at this point. When we're in an HTTP2 world, our lives get a lot easier because we don't have to worry about that crap. So learn about this. Spend time understanding the latency costs in TCP and how HTTP2 fixes that. And then start, you know, kind of tinkering around with getting your server set up uh, so they can handle this. Uh, my slides are on my website here, and you can tweet at me at Coleman Z. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. And I got to um, give you a microphone. Um, so, kind of two questions. First one is um, you mentioned prioritizing. Uh, is that something that you have to do? On a server level, or is that something? Is it like a tag you can put with the inline in your markup to say, hey, these style sheets are first, and then JavaScript type of thing? Um, and then secondly, uh, good. I, I had a second, I forgot it. But okay, yeah, I'll, I'll kill some time while you're thinking. Um, that's primarily con so prior prioritization is primarily controlled by the client because the client knows what it needs. Um, so in the case of the clients, we're generally talking about browsers, but you can have other things like a, a curl client, right? And it may have other priorities. Um, the client knows what it needs, so it's going to be sending a lot of that prioritization information. It's controlled there. Uh, I think the client that has the best support for prioritization right now is Firefox, and Chrome is lagging a little bit behind in that. The server has an opportunity to influence it, um, but there's actually not much you do as a web developer because these things are, are universal. We know that CSS is going to be really important. And at this point, um, there's nothing you can do from your application. Um, I suppose if you wanted to write some C code, you can maybe have like some sort of patch you can get in for you know, a server, but it's mostly gonna be controlled by the client. Okay, and then the other one was um, HTTPS is great, but how do you deal with things like caching and stuff like that that don't really work as well over an HTTPS connection? Uh, caching works just fine over HTTPS. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I think people tend to have this assumption that it doesn't because there's always been this notion that you, you only set up a certificate and do HTTPS if you're doing like e-commerce and that you have like carts and things like that that are state that needs to be managed on a user by user basis. Um, but just for like a WordPress site where there's there's nothing that's changing, all the caching rules apply. There, there's nothing different about that. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'll let you decide. <laughs> there's two hands back there. I two questions as well. The first one is, um, you said at one point the um, in HTTP2, when you're sending a request, say you're sending um, your PHP file or your HTML and your CSS, it will ask if you need the CSS file? Yeah, it sends what's known as a push promise, and so it can reject it. Is that a quick? Is, okay. It is quick. You're still going to have some latency in but so far in my limited experiences with that, I found it to um, produce results like similar to inlining. Um, I think as we uh, see more servers and sites supporting HTTP2, we're gonna learn the best practices around that. I'm still undecided on whether you still should 
say like for, for getting the CSS down quickly, if you should do something like have a small bit of CSS, like 14K, it's usually what people will recommend because of some TCP things, and then have the rest of it async. I'm not sure what the best uh, solution is there yet, but I think we're gonna see a lot of people investigating those things. And what about if, so say that you wanted to start using HTTP2, and someone hits your site with a browser that's not supported, what happens? So uh, smart, Servers, which the ones that I've mentioned today, I would all classify as smart servers. They can ha they can still handle the HTTP one request. So the one thing that uh, maybe I'll anticipate a question here is like, well, what if you want to optimize for HTTP two? Are you then like removing all your special HTTP one optimizations? Absolutely. I. Uh, 100% do not endorse the idea of trying to have two versions of your site, one that's optimized for HTTP 2 and one that's for HTTP 1. Uh, you will go crazy, that's not good, we don't like that. Um, so, you know, you look at your traffic, figure out who's visiting your site, and figure out who you want to optimize for. Yeah, kind of, kind of on that note, um, do you feel like HTTP 2 is fast enough where you could maybe give a lot of dynamic, dynamic content maybe for going? Page caching on the server, and uh, or, or in an ideal workflow, would you still would you still cache uh, page cache on the server and use HTTP two? Uh, absolutely, do not endorse getting rid of page caching. So, page caching uh, is a whole separate concern for WordPress. Loading a page is really, really, really slow. Um, even if you've optimized like all your code in WordPress, even if it's just like a bare bones core install, it's really, really slow. We're hitting the database all the time and it's slow. It's unfortunate, it's just the way it is. Um, so page caching is an absolute necessity. So when I was showing like, when you would make requests and it was like a 50 second latency, when you hit the server, if the server takes 300 milliseconds to generate, there's more time involved in that. The best thing you can do is have static files so it's like an instant, it'd be like five, 10 milliseconds to retrieve the data and send it. Whereas if you have a heavy page and it takes a second to load, you're gonna pay that cost as well. Cool, thanks. Uh, there's one up here and then one back there. Let's come up here first, I guess. Um, <clears throat> if, uh, if the server can just send you whatever it wants, what are the security implications there? The client can, the client can shut that down. So the client's able to do that. There has been concerns about uh, security around that. I'm just trying to think if I have any specific knowledge about that. Um, that that's absolutely like the first thing that came up when they wanted to do uh, server push. I, I think the, the mechanism at this point is allowing the client to be able to reject that. Um, and your server can't just start pushing random things. It needs to be in response. In, in response to a request that can put push additional things. The mechanism for doing that actually is you send a response header, and then that header is read, and then that request is made. Um, I don't know a lot of the security, uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll, how that security issue is being handled. My guess is we'll probably see like that exploited at some point, and then we'll get better at doing that. Uh, but right now, the, the main mechanism is the client can reject it. There was one back there, I don't... Okay, I just answered it, yay. Multiplexing. So is there gonna be any impact on shared hosting? Like if these servers are suddenly pushing lots of stuff all at once, and maybe before they've been doing little bits of pushing? I actually think that um, because of the reduction in number of connections that you're going to see improved performance on shared machines. Um, but I don't know if there's any uh, systems administrators around here that work for those types of companies, but um, you save a ton of resources. There is less protocol overhead, so there, there's less, um, the machine has to allocate less resources to making TCP connections, because right now, uh, instead of doing six connections to that site, you're only doing one. So there's a lot of resources that are saved there on the server side. So I think uh, yeah, hosts will really like to see this. So I think one more. Okay. Um, so am I understanding correctly from your earlier response that essentially um, there isn't really going to be a clean migration path. At some point you just decide to make the code over to HPP2 and stop bundling and everything. But there isn't really anything in the meantime you could do to ease that for clients who are coming and still on HTTP1? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so I should say 
before I answer that specific question, um, the upgrade path is really easy. You basically just need to get a HTTP2 server, and once you have that set up, you're on HTTP2. There's nothing you need to do. You don't need to change anything about your application for it to work on HTTP2. You should make changes to your application so you're using HTTP2 in the best way possible. And fortunately, if you've been doing this right, that usually means just removing optimization. So like, don't do your build that you used to do. Don't uh, like uninstall that plugin that tries to manage plugin dependence or uh, 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 CSS concatenation, JavaScript concatenation, WordPress, and then like be very excited, like go drink a beer or something because you don't have to deal with that plugin anymore because they just don't work well. They they really suck generally, and there's really good people writing these. It's a hard problem. It's really difficult. You get to uninstall that plugin and it just works. So I would say to that, um, just look at your users. Look at who's connecting to your website. And if you're seeing, I would say, more users that have HTTP2 capable browsers, it would be a good time for you to make that move. And unfortunately, the people who are not updating their software, um, they're going to be left behind, but you're going to be optimizing for the for more people uh, who are visiting your site. And I think that'll come, well, the slides aren't up there anymore, but that'll come when we see uh, Safari updated. That's a huge one. Uh, so unfortunately, I, I have to cut it off there. Um, I'm going to be doing happiness bar. Uh, write it too. So if anybody wants to talk about this, I love talking about any performance or security related stuff. So come chat. Thank you, everyone.